ways to bring mental equilibrium. <laughs> One of the very important ways. Every home must have a full set of Shambhava, apart from Bhagavad Gita. And it shouldn't be just kept as it is. <laughs> Bhagavad Gita as it is is not meant to be kept as it is on the shelf. It is meant to be read, like Srimad Bhagavatam also. How many of you do not have Srimad Bhagavatam in your homes? Okay, so the first thing you're going to do is, tomorrow, you will get a set and keep in your house. Actually, even if you don't read, just the fact that the Bhagavatam is in your house, very auspicious. And if you read, even more auspicious. You apply in your life, your life is successful. So Srimad Bhagavatam is a transcendental jewel that has descended from the spiritual world into this world to enable us to go back to the spiritual world. When Sutta Goswami, the great sage, who was speaking Srimad Bhagavatam to the sages at Nanvishalanya, they asked him one question. Because Sutta Goswami had heard the Srimad Bhagavatam being spoken by Shukadeva Goswami to King Parikshit. And he remembered the whole dialogue, seven days of dialogue, he remembered it, just by sitting there. He didn't have any recorder, anything of the sound. Simply remembered it just by hearing it. And when he came to Naimisharanya, which is near present day Kanpur, there he was asked by the sages at Naimisharanya to recite the Shiva Bhagavatam, which he happily began doing. And one of the questions they asked him was, that now that Krishna has departed from this world, because by the time Krishna's disappearance, pastime had taken place. So now that Krishna has departed from this world, taking away dharma, jnana, everything with him, how will the people of this world, who are in ignorance, know what the perfection of life is? How will they know what spirituality is, what dharma is, what religion is, what God is, what knowledge is? How will they know this? So Sutta Goswami then replies, Krishna is padham upakate dharma jnana dibhisaha Kalo nashta drishami shapurana kota mojita He said, my dear sages, not to worry. Even though Sri Krishna has departed for the spiritual world, taking dharma jnana etc. with him, dharma jnana adhi saha, along with him, these have also gone. Krishna svadha, that means his own purport, upagate, having gone, along with dharma jnana etc. Kalo nusht drisham desha. Kalo means for in this age of Kali, Kali Yuga. Nusht drisham, those whose vision has been destroyed. Which vision? Spiritual vision. Esha, for them. Kalo nusht drisham esha, for the sake of those people in the upcoming Kali Yuga, because Kali Yuga had not yet begun, but just about begun. So those who are going to be living in Kali Yuga, they will not have spiritual vision, they will be spiritually blind. So just for their benefit, something wonderful has happened. Kalo Nashta Vishamesha Purana Arkaha Aduna Kutitaha Purana, this Purana, you know, there are many Puranas and Upanishads, there are many varieties of scriptures. So, this Purana, which Purana? The one that is being spoken about, Bhagavad Purana, the Srimad Bhagavatam. <coughs> Purana Arka, Arka means the sun. Aduna Udita. So, this Bhagavatam, the Srimad Bhagavatam, is like the transcendental sun just that has just now arisen. 
the newly arisen son of the Shri Mahabharatam. Puranarko Tanotatam Kubitam. So then, this is the way forward. For all the people of Kali Yuga who want direction about where to, how to lead their lives, what is the goal of life, how to progress in their life, etc. So Srimad Bhagavatam will provide us all the answers. It will even tell us the right questions to ask. You see, unless you know what questions to ask, how will you know what the right answers are? Correct? <clears throat> you know the story of that person who was searching for a, saw something under a lamppost at night, and then somebody came up and asked him, what are you searching for? He said, my keys. And he asked him, well, where did you drop it? He said, I dropped it right over there. Well, then if you dropped it over there, why are you searching for the keys here? Because there's light here and it's dark there. <laughs> so if you don't know what questions to ask, you're like that man. So then naturally, whatever answers you get in the little light that's available, <coughs> What good is it going to be? It's not going to give you any lasting benefit or any real welfare. It's not going to cause real welfare of anybody. So the darkness is there because of the ignorance. And the ignorance is dispelled by the torchlight of knowledge as given in the Bhagavad Gita and in the Srimad Bhagavata. <coughs> so this is the sun. Just as at night, People are afraid to step out into the dark because there could be potholes in the ground, there could be snakes coming out. We're talking about the villages in the old days. There could be snakes coming in, there could be wild animals that come in, potholes or a ditch in which you could fall, you could knock into something and hurt yourself. There could be thieves coming to attack you. So when you step out into the dark night, because you don't know what's ahead of you, there's some fear. Yes, more than this. <laughs> so when there is ignorance, then there is fear. So also, when there is ignorance of spiritual knowledge, then there is fear. But when the sun rises, then automatically, because we can see everything clearly, there is knowledge of what's around me, so there is no fear. Oh, there's no ditch here. Oh, there's no thieves around. There's no snakes or wild animals. It's fine, I can go. So the sunlight brings in fearlessness. When there's fear, the mind is disturbed. There's, <coughs> there's anxiety. Yes? So therefore, peace is never possible. So peace is never possible when there is anxiety in the mind, when there is fear. How can you have mental equilibrium in such a condition? It's not possible. In the 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, there is a verse, Bhayam Kutiya Bhimadeshata Syad Ishada Betas Chabipati The meaning of this verse is that when the living entity turns his back to Krishna, figuratively, meaning that he becomes opposed to Krishna, starts becoming an atheist and agnostic and who doesn't follow uh, Krishna's will and so on, <coughs> then his life, his mind becomes absorbed in illusion, in maya, and therefore there arises fear and all other such negative emotions in that person's, that entity's mind. You know, the natural condition of the universe is that there is sunlight everywhere. But still darkness happens. Why? Because the planets move in such a way that when your back is to the sun, then there is darkness. So even though there is bright sunlight, if you go into the sunlight and place your sun towards the back, your back towards the sun, rather, then what's in front of you? The shadow, which is darkness. Right? So even in the midst of the bright sunlight, you can have darkness. 
then the darkness is because we are showing the sun on the back. So in the front we see darkness. So similarly, <coughs> actually we are meant to be full of knowledge. But the moment we show our backs to Krishna, we turn around and we ignore Krishna, then automatically there's darkness of ignorance. Mm. That from that moment on there's fear, there's anxiety, there's so many other things that come up. <coughs> and in that darkness, then there's no knowing what we may be doing. Sometimes in panic, people do all sorts of things. Yes. So therefore, in material consciousness, the living entity can do anything because of ignorance and anxiety and fear and hatred and greed and so on and so forth. So this verse is important. Vitiya abhivineshataha. Abhivineshataha means absorption. And Vitiya means second. So when the mind is absorbed in anything second, anything other than Krishna, the moment the mind is absorbed in anything other than Krishna, there is fear. There is anxiety. There is ignorance. So the mind, how can it be peaceful? How can it be in equilibrium? It's not possible. So the way to keep the mind peaceful <coughs> is to focus the mind on Krishna. Bhajavure mana, Sri Nanda Nandana, Abhaya Charanaradindare. Have you all heard this bhajan, this song? How many have heard it? You should sing it sometime. Maybe in the sun, in your groups, you can sing it one time. It's a very important, popular bhajan. Bhajahude Mana. So, the devotee, Krishna is preaching to his own uh, mind. You see, he preached to so many other people to bring them to Krishna consciousness, isn't it? Please we distribute the book. Please read this book, we tell another person, please chant Hare Krishna. So we're preaching to so many people to bring them to Krishna. You know what the most important preaching is? What is the most important preaching? The most difficult one to preach to? The own mind. Because the mind is a thing in itself, as Milton said, it can make a hell out of heaven and heaven out of hell. That's the nature of the mind. <coughs> And the mind is constantly trying, trying to delude us, to deceive us, to take us away from Krishna. But don't go for that satsang, just stay back and relax. Where do you want to go now? Mm -hmm. Have a little genie coming out, just stay back. Mm -hmm. What's the big hurry? You have your whole life ahead. Why just go to the satsang every time and give yourself so much trouble? So the mind will act in that deceptive way. <coughs> That is a function of the mind. The mind will do all these things. The mind's function is to delude us. Therefore, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says the mind can be your worst enemy. But the mind can also be your best friend. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, for one who has controlled the mind, the mind is the best friend. And for one who has not controlled the mind, the mind is the worst enemy. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur would say that maybe we should raise the... Yeah. 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 No, I mean, physically raise the... On a chair, if you take it on a chair, then the sound will... Can't we increase the... Maybe that would help. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Can you hear better now? Yes, yeah. well, that's right. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur used to say that the mind is such a thing that every morning when you wake up you should beat it thousand times with a broom. At night you should beat it two thousand times with your shoes. <laughs> now don't take that too literally. 
But what Dr. Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur is wanting to say is that you have to be cautious. Don't, don't succumb to the whims of the mind. Listen to Krishna, not to the whimsical mind. So therefore, we need to preach to our own mind. And Raghunath Das Goswami has written a whole book called Manaha Shiksha, Teachings to the Mind. So the great Vaishnavas teach us how we should preach to our own mind. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur has also written many nice verses about this. So we preach to our mind, oh mind, where, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think you are doing? Do you think you are going to get happiness like this? Don't deceive yourself. We have to use our spiritual intelligence to control the mind. Because the mind that is not absorbed in Krishna can never be in equilibrium. So if the mind is saying, let's go away from Krishna, then you'll be sure that you're going to be disturbed. Even though temporarily there may be some apparent calm. So we have to somehow or the other use our spiritual intelligence to bring the mind to Krishna, somehow or the other. Yena kena prakara yena manahi mana krishna nivesha Somehow or the other, by hook or by crook, yena kena prakara that means somehow or the other. By hook or by crook, bring the mind, focus the mind on Krishna. <coughs> That's the way to go. And how do you do that? By engaging all the senses and our body, mind, everything in Krishna's service. This is devotional service. This is bhakti. What is the meaning of bhakti? What is the definition of bhakti? There are many definitions. Can you give some of the definitions of bhakti? Of Krishna. To love Lord Krishna, okay. But love indicates what? Is it just a passive love? I love Krishna and I don't do anything. Krishna serve. To serve. There's no meaning to love without service. How many of you are mothers? Okay. You had children when they were very young. Very, very young, let's say. And somebody asked you, how is it, you see, I stayed up all night. Right? It happened so many times in your experience. You see, suppose you love your child, and when the time comes in the middle of the night to wake up, you say, no, I love, but I just love. No. <laughs> <laughs> love and serve, which means you take trouble, you wake up in the middle of the night, you do whatever is necessary to look after the child, day or night, or whatever it is. So without service, what is the meaning of love? One time in one program, one lady asked the question, why do you speak about service to Krishna? I think of Krishna in my heart all the time. You love Krishna? I asked, I said, yes, yes, I love Krishna in the heart. Do you love your children? I said, yes, I love my children. Do you serve them? Mm, yes. So why did you just say when your child is hungry, I love you, but I won't cook for you. <laughs> I just keep your love for you in my heart. I'll sit back and just love you. My children, you, you just get fed on my love. Your breakfast, lunch, dinner, everything, you just be the love of my heart. Is that possible? You have to act. If you have love, you will act naturally and spontaneously. So if someone says, I have love for Krishna, but is not willing to serve Krishna, then that's not real love. So love means service. Therefore the definition of bhakti, or devotion of Prabhupada translated bhakti as not just devotion. Ordinarily, if you look at other people who may have translated the word bhakti, they will do it as translated as devotion. But Prabhupada's definition is very distinctive. He translated it as devotional service. service. And he explains this point that I've added this word service deliberately to show that bhakti or love of God is not just a passive, lazy affair. That one simply just sits and claims that one loves Krishna. Because it can be misused. Sometimes people ask or they tell us, Oh, it's easy for all of you, just sit all day and just chant Hare Krishna and activity. 
but they don't realize. First of all, that sitting all day and chanting Hare Krishna is a huge, humongous, difficult task to do. Have you tried it? Sitting all day and just chanting Hare Krishna? It's very difficult unless one has, like Haridas Thakur, you cannot sit all day, every day and just chant Hare Krishna, Hare Rama. No, that's not possible. And secondly, I said, that's not what devotees do, sitting down in one place all day. They're always busy serving Krishna in so many ways. Now if you go to the temple, you'll see the devotees are all on the fields, you know, setting up tents and digging the ground and doing all sorts of things, carrying things from here and there, practical devotional service. Many of you probably also go for the seva in the evenings. So devotional service, devotion means service. So, one of the definitions of bhakti is sarvo padhi nirmuktam tat parakvena nirvalam rishikena rishikesha sevanam bhakti ujjhati. The senses are called rishika. And the master of the senses, Isha, Isha means Lord. So, the Lord of our senses, the proprietor and master of our senses is Krishna, rishikesha. So Rishika and Isha, when you combine these two words, you get Rishikesh. <coughs> by our senses, by our Rishikas, we serve Rishikesh. That's Bhakti. Simplest definition of Bhakti is to use your senses, your mind, your intelligence, your money also, <laughs> your family, your house, everything for Krishna's service. That is devotional service. <coughs> so the whatever senses you have, use them for Krishna's service. Okay, can anyone Google and give me the thing so that we can all chant this together? Savai Vanaha Krishna Padaravinda Yod. That start the verse starting with that. And those of you who have your gadgets, you can open this verse. The famous verse by Abhadish Maharaj. And we're all going to recite these two verses. And then we'll see the perfect formula for keeping mental equilibrium. It starts with Sa by S A. Next word is V A I. Third word is Manaha, M-A-N-A-H. Third, next word is Krishna. And then Padaravindam. Savai Manaha Krishna Padaravindam. Vacham si Vaikuntra Punanu Varnani is the next line. How many of you have found it? I Yes. Nine four eighteen nineteen twenty. <coughs> so it would be nice if you can meditate on these three verses. This will be the essence of my talk today. If you forget the other things, never mind. But you remember the essence or the contents of these three verses. Even if you don't remember the Sanskrit, it's okay. But the meaning, the purport you should remember. <coughs> this is spoken in glorification of King Ambarish. Ambarish Maharaj was a king. But that didn't stop him from being a great devotee of Krishna. And he used all his senses, his mind, everything in the service of Krishna. You see the sense of sight, the sense of hearing, the sense of touch, the sense of taste, the hands, the legs, the body, the mind, 
He used everything in the service of Krishna. And that was a perfect execution of devotional service. And therefore his mind was always in equilibrium. When Durvasa Muni came to him, how many of you know the story of Durvasa Muni and Ambarish Maharaj? Okay, so before that, very few of you know it. So I will tell you the story in brief. Now Durvasa Muni is a yogi who is known for his fierce temper. He gets inflamed with rage very fast if, if somebody doesn't do something right, if he doesn't serve him properly or offends him. And he curses and his curses are terrible. But he also gets pleased very fast. If he's happy with your service, he is very happy and blesses you. Right? So one time he came to the palace of, of King Ambarish. And Ambarish Maharaj welcomed him with sweet words and made him sit down and everything. And then he, he came, the, the sage said, all right, I'll just go for a bath and come back. And then arrange a feast for me. So the feast was not a problem. So the sage went to take a bath. In the meanwhile, what had happened was that King Ambarish had been maintaining a fast. And the time for breaking the fast had arrived. And if it didn't break the fast at that particular time, the effect of the fast would have been lost and it would have been an offense. Now, at the same time, when an exalted guest like Durvasamuni comes, you are supposed to feed him first and then eat later. You are not supposed to eat first and feed your guest later. That's the culture. So now he was in a quandary. What to do? If I wait for Durvasamuni to come back, it will be late for me to break my fast. The Paran time. Paran. Paran is the time for breaking the fast. That will get over. Uh, and if I eat now, then it will be uh, offensive to the saint and he will curse me as well. So he consulted a few of the Brahmins and the ministers around. And then they came to the conclusion that he could just take one or two drops of Charnamrit, the water that has washed the lotus feet of Krishna, of the deity. Take a little, so that's as good as breaking the fast. You've broken the fast and yet you've not broken the fast. You've eaten and yet you've not eaten. So they were very intelligent, he came to this conclusion. So he did that. When Durvasa Muni came back, he understood that the king had taken some Charnamrit. So he became very angry. So you have disrespected me and you have had something before uh, my return. So in great anger he pulled out a hair from his head and smashed it to the ground and there was a huge demon who emerged from that. And the demon that attacked Ambarish Maharaj. Now Ambarish Maharaj when he saw the demon he was just standing with folded hands. He didn't call police, he didn't call the soldiers, he didn't say anything, he was just remembering Krishna and standing there with folded hands. But of course, Krishna wasn't standing only with folded hands. When he saw his devotee in danger, Krishna said, no, I can't allow this. In fact, Krishna Sudarshan Chakra was even more anxious <laughs> because the devotees of Krishna never like to see other devotees in difficulty. So the Sudar Sudarshan Chakra flew out of Krishna's hands and immediately came to the demon and burnt him to ashes. Right there and then. Because after all, Sudarshan Chakra is not bound by the tra traffic laws and so on. It can go anywhere. And then the Sudarshan Chakra came for Durvasamani. Durvasamani saw this and fled for his life. And again, he's also not dependent on, on the ring roads and the MNs so-and-so, A, so-and-so, junction roads and exit roads. And he just flew. He went all over the earth, but everywhere Sudarshan Chakra was moving fast behind him, flying. The heat was singeing his back. And then he went beyond earth, hoping he could get rid of this that was on his back. And then it didn't work. He went to Indra. Indra says, please go away, don't come here, don't come here, don't come. <laughs> I'm in trouble with the Sudarshan Chakra coming here, yeah, just go away. 
don't come here. He tried everywhere, he went to Brahma, he said, sorry, wrong number, don't come here. <laughs> Went to Shiva, Shiva also said, I'm sorry, just, I just can't do anything. They all saw Sudarshan Shakara, they just retreated in haste. And then finally went to Vishnu. He fell at Lord Vishnu's feet and Vishnu said, I'm sorry, even I can't do anything. Because you have offended my devotee. And even I cannot forgive you. You don't know the glories of my devotees, or yogi, or brahmin. You may be a great yogi and a great brahmin, but my devotees are dear to me, more dear to me than yogis and brahmins and so on. In fact, these devotees are so glorious that they control me. Aham bhakta paradhino hi sadhubhir krastavidayo bhakta bhakta Priya Bhakta, Bhakta Janapriya. He tells the Vasamuni that, you know, I am not independent. I can't fulfill your desire independently. I am simply under the control of my devotees. He asvatantra eva. I am not svatantra. I am not independent. I am dependent on my devotees. The sadhus, the devotees are my life. And for them, I am their life. And even the devotees of my devotees are very dear to me. So you don't understand the glories of my devotees and you have dared to offend my devotee? So if you want to be saved from the wrath of the Sudarshan Chakra, then you have to go and beg forgiveness from Ambarish Maharaj, the person you have offended. And only if Ambarish Maharaj requests Sudarshan, then Sudarshan may refrain from harming you. So, so long as, as uh, Durvasamani was talking to Lord Vishnu, out of respect for his master, Sudarshan kept a distance. Still, the heat was there. So, immediately, Durvasamani came back to Ambarish Maharaj, who was still standing with folded hands, waiting for his guest to come back, because he had to feed him and then eat himself. Just look at Ambarish Maharaj's qualities. Why? Because he was completely thinking of Krishna all the time. He was fearless and without anxiety. And then Durvasamuni came and fell at his feet and said, please forgive me, please forgive me, you know, get, get this Sudarshan off my back. And uh, Ambarish Maharaj being a humble, gentle Vaishnava, even though he was a powerful king, <coughs> he felt very embarrassed. He said, you are such a great yogi, a big Brahmin, a mystic, and I am just a householder, I am a king, and you are falling at my feet like this, I feel so embarrassed. It's not right. And then he turns to Sudarshan and says, if at all I have done any, any good things in my life, if I have any devotional or pious credits to my account, please consider them and do not cause harm to my guest. Then Sudarshan, after this entreaty, becomes pacified and then withdraws and goes away. And then Durva Samuni heals a huge sigh of relief. <laughs> he sits down for a while. Uh, and then he says, now today I have understood the glories of Krishna's devotees. So this is the background. So this is a little pastime in brief. So the, the Srimad Bhagavatam glorifies Maharaj, Maharaj Ambarish's devotion. And how he was completely fixed in devotional service. And the verse begins with this, Savai Manaha Krishna Padaravanda Yor. That his mind, Manaha, was always engaged in the lotus feet of Krishna. So how many of you have found this verse? How many of you have it? Please raise your hand. Okay, few. But you can follow me as I recite. So even if you don't have it in front of you, but you can recite it. It's fourth chapter of 9, 4, 18, 19 and 20. Okay? So will you all recite this verse after me? Savai manaha krishna padara vinda yar Savai manaha krishna padara vinda yar 
Vacham Sivay Kuntha Guna Nuvarna Ne Vacham Sivay Kuntha Guna Nuvarna Ne Karau Mandir Marjana Dishu Karau Mandir Marjana Shrutin Chakara Chuta Sakkato Daye Mukundalinga Laya Darshani Drishau Mukundalinga Darshani Drishau Sangamam Granam Chatapa the Saroja Saurabe Granam Chatapa the Saroja Saurabe Shri Matulasya Rasanam Tadarpike Shri Matulasya Rasanam Tadarpike Pado Hare Padanu Sarpane Pado Hare Shiro Rishi Kesha Pada Bivandani Shiro Rishi Kesha Pada Bivandani Kamam Chadasye Natu Kama Kam Jaya Kamam Chadasye Natu Kama Kam Jaya Yathottama Shloka Janashra Yarati Yathottama Shloka Janashra Yarati Srila Prabhupada's translation of these three verses. King Ambarish fixed his mind on the lotus feet of Lord Krishna, engaged his words in describing the abode of the Lord, his hands in cleansing the temple of the Lord, his ears in hearing the pastimes of the Lord, his eyes in seeing the form of the Lord, his body in touching the body of the devotees, his nostrils in smelling the flavor of the flowers offered to the lotus feet of the Lord, his tongue in tasting the tulasi leaves offered to him, his legs in traveling to the holy places where his temple is situated, his head in offering obeisances unto the Lord, and his desires in fulfilling the desires of the Lord. And all these qualifications <coughs> made him fit to become a matpara, devotee of the Lord. A wonderful instance of how Ambarish Maharaj engaged all his senses. Okay, so how did Ambarish Maharaj engage his mind? How did he employ his mind? Always thinking about pizza, sorry, sorry. <laughs> the lotus feet of Krishna. How did, how did Ambarish Maharaj use his sense of speech, his power of speech? You heard the translation. How would you, what's the best way to use your power of, your power of speech? To glorify Krishna. How did he use his ears? He heard about Krishna. How did he use his nose? To smell the flowers and tulsi leaves offered to Krishna. How did he use his tongue to taste the prasadam, specifically granamcha tulas, tulasya? So he tasted the tulasi offered to the lotus feet of the Lord with his tongue. How did he engage his sense of touch? By embracing the devotees, how did he engage his hands? By cleaning the temple, how did he engage his legs? By walking to the holy places, circumambulating the temple, and also by using his feet to move the clutch and the brake and everything to go to the temple. <laughs> And how did he use his head? Bowing down before the Lord. How did he utilize his capacity to have desires? The last point. 
His desires in fulfilling the desires of the Lord. So that is the devotee's desire. To fulfill Krishna's desire. It's not that we have our own shopping list and go to Krishna. Krishna, I have all these desires and you must fulfill them. One, two, three, and you fulfilled only seven out of ten. What about the other three? No. We go to Krishna and ask, please tell us what is your desire and we will fulfill that. If that is our approach, the mind will be blissful. Not just peaceful. The topic today is mental equilibrium. But mental equilibrium is not what we are seeking in life. We are seeking bliss. We are seeking joy. We have to go even beyond peace. Because in a sense, in this material world, there is no peace possible. Every day something is going to happen in your life. For sure. Shall I give it in writing? <laughs> Every day. Something will happen that will irritate you, that will disturb you. Yes? Out of the blue, having no connection with you. Somebody behind you, somebody in front of you in the traffic. Anything. Sometimes your colleagues, sometimes somebody at home. Sometimes you bang into something and hurt yourself. Something or the other keeps happening. So there is no peace really sticking in this world. But what you can try to do is avoid unnecessary mental troubles that arise by absorbing the consciousness in Maya. So then we serve Krishna, absorb ourselves in Krishna's service, and then we will feel blissful. So when we go to Krishna saying, I want, I want, I want, then even though we are doing some devotional service, but it's not pure, it's mixed devotional service. Therefore, we don't feel that happy. Whereas when we go to Krishna and say, Krishna, whatever is your desire, I will fulfill, then we feel tremendous happiness, joy, transcendental bliss. <clears throat> but if we don't use our senses and our mind in Krishna's service, then they will be the cause of great pain and eventual destruction to all of us. I often give different examples to illustrate how the senses, when not used in the service of Krishna, can lead to disaster. And he gives the example of each sense. For example, the sense of sight. There are certain kinds of moths, insects, that love the fire. Have you seen them? And they rush into the fire because they're madly attracted by the flame, by the color. And they don't realize that they're actually plunging into their death. But they're so attracted to the form of the fire, they just rush into that. And eventually perish, they get burnt. So similarly in this world also, the eyes are always looking for form that is beautiful. We want to have a form that is beautiful. We want to look at those things that are beautiful. And then eventually, because it's in forgetfulness of Krishna, then it leads to so many problems in life. The years, the meant for hearing about Krishna. Srila Prabhupada gives the example of the deer. You know how a deer is hunted, caught live by a hunter? Or even if you want to kill it, because deer are very a fleet, uh, uh, nimble feet. Like they have nimble feet, right? So uh, they run very fast and they're very touchy, very sensitive. Have you seen deer any time? They're always looking here and they're looking here and they're behind. The slightest noise or the indication of any danger, they just bolt from there very fast. So it's very hard to actually track them. So do you know how the hunters catch them live? There are certain specialized class of people who do that without shooting, without harming the deer. Does anyone know? Singing. Hmm? By playing some musical instruments, by music. You see, they play some, uh, some kind of music instrument and 
this used to happen in Vrindavan when Krishna played the flute also. So the deer is mesmerized, almost intoxicated by that music. It just comes closer and closer. It's like it lost its consciousness. It lost its sense of discrimination. The deer starts moving towards the music. It starts swaying. It comes there attracted by the melodious sound of that musical instrument. And it comes very close to the person who is playing. If that person moves even an inch, immediately the deer comes to his external consciousness and runs away. So the person who is playing it has to be very careful. He has to completely not show any indication that he is aware of the deer's proximity. And one devotee was saying how he actually experienced this. He did it and the deer actually came very close to him, almost touching him. And the moment he looked, the deer fled mm -hmm. out of great fear. But till then that fear was not there because the music had taken over. The years had been captured, captivated. He was so captivated by that sound. So the hunter then captures the deer. So similarly, we also like to hear non-devotional sounds from here and there, different forms of mundane music and talk and so on. We get attracted by that and eventually it leads to our destruction. Because it's all material, so eventually it leads to a repetition of cycle of birth and death. Similarly, the sense of taste. There's a fish. How does a fish get hooked by a fisherman? I hope you don't have any personal experience of this. <laughs> but at least by reading about it and hearing about others, you know, the fisherman goes with a rod. It has a wire, at the end of it there's a hook, on the hook there's a worm, and the fish sees that worm, ah, delicious, delicious food, and goes to get that worm. The moment it puts its mouth around it, the fisherman pulls up the rod, and the fish dies. So similarly, we are always running here and there, searching for some delicious food to satisfy the urges of the palate or the tongue. And eventually, then we waste our whole life and nothing happens. We have to face death and birth again and again and again. Then the sense of touch. You know, the elephant. You know how you capture an elephant? Such a huge creature, mighty animal. You're afraid to even come near it. If you want to capture a live elephant, what do you do? Dig a hole in the ground and put grass on it and she elephant. Yes, they keep a female elephant on the other side. So the elephant wants to associate with the she elephant. She comes. Normally elephants are very, very cautious when it comes to a little, even a little ditch. Because you see elephants have a huge body. So they fall inside, then they can't come out. It's not easy. But when he sees a she elephant and wants to touch, then he loses his sense of discrimination, he loses his sense of caution, and he runs. And then he doesn't notice that there's grass covering, there's a hole inside that he falls in. And then the hunter can capture him and take him away. So the sense of hmm, sight, hearing, uh, taste, touch, and what remains, Smell. We also want wonderful smells everywhere. We want our senses to be engaged in all these different beautiful, fragrant smells. You've heard of musk perfume? Musk is a very fragrant substance. You know how it comes? Where it comes from? From the deer. There's a deer. In Sanskrit it's called kastur. So, it comes from an animal called the Kasturi brig, the musk deer, found in the Himalayas. And this is a secretion from the body of that deer. And the, the deer is not able to understand where the fragrance is coming from. It is such a heady and powerful fragrance, the deer goes mad and is trying to figure out where is this fragrance coming from and runs all over the forest thinking maybe it's coming from this side, that side, because the fragrance is right on his body, so it's coming into its nostrils 
and looking here and there runs all over the forest and ultimately out of sheer exhaustion falls down and dies. So similarly for us, we engage our senses in this way, in a futile way, devoid of Krishna consciousness. Eventually, we all perish, then we have to take birth again. The same story repeats, again death, then birth again. So birth and death, and birth and death, this cycle of birth and death goes on and on and on because our senses are demanding satisfaction. And we, we are engaged simply in doing that and not worrying about Krishna. But if we engage all the senses like Maharaj Ambarish did in serving Krishna, that would be the perfection of the senses. That would be the perfection of our life. And by doing that, we will be very happy. The mind will also be controlled and not agitated. We will be in perfect equilibrium when we are using all our senses and mind and intelligence in Krishna's service. So we use the eyes for seeing the beautiful form of the deity, the beautiful paintings of Krishna. We use our ears to hear about Krishna, the various pastimes and so on, messages from Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, lectures, etc. We use our sense of speech to speak about Krishna. We use the tongue to taste Krishna Prasadam. We use our nostrils to smell everything that is offered to Krishna, the incense, the flowers, the tulasi. We use our bodies to embrace the devotees, to offer obeisances to the deities. In this way we engage our senses and mind. In mind we think about Krishna. Then our mind becomes very peaceful, very happy. And we can also simultaneously make advancement in Krishna consciousness. The more our mind is controlled automatically. We do not even have to separately strive to bring the mind in equilibrium. Just chant well, hear well, serve Krishna nicely and be absorbed in that. And the mind will automatically be controlled and peaceful. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna. One of the ways of keeping the mind peaceful is to not let the lectures go on too long. <laughs> Otherwise, there is danger of the mind either becoming very disturbed or becoming too peaceful. <laughs> because when you sleep, then you are too peaceful. So thank you very much for coming here. I'm sorry once again that I was late in coming. Made all of you wait for a long time. And our hosts are Ajay and Madhuri. Yes. Thank you for your hospitality. And uh, this is Krishna Purna Mataji's Sangha. Yes. You have two, three Sanghas meeting here at one time. Two here. Two Sanghas here. So I'm very happy to come back to your Sanghas again. And uh, wish. Both the groups of devotees, all the very best for progress in Krishna consciousness. Don't worry about the mental equilibrium part of it, that will come automatically. Just serve Krishna nicely and everything will follow. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes. I have like a small question. How can we know the Krishna's desire? So when we go to temples, how is that? What can is we know desire? Krishna's desire? Yeah. By hearing from the scripture, because Krishna expresses his desires in the scripture. In the Bhagavad Gita, he says, Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam Yome Bhaktiya If someone offers me with love, even a leaf, a fruit, flower, or water, then I'm very happy. So you offer things to Krishna that he allows you to offer. <coughs> and that he will be very happy, that's his desire. Man mana bhagamat bhakto matyaji maam namaskaru. So he wants us to become his devotee. He wants us to think about him. He wants us to offer obeisances to him. He wants us to worship him. So he has expressed his desires in so many places in the different scriptures. So we have to hear the discourses of Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. We have to read Srila Prabhupada's books. 
and we will understand what are Krishna's desires and we can follow them. Okay. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.